for his leadership throughout uh, this entire debate. Um, he, like a number of us, have been working hard with members across the aisle to try to get a bipartisan solution that's balanced, that makes sense, uh, heading toward the future, and I thank him for his leadership, and I yield the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The Senator from Alaska. Uh, my friend and colleague from Colorado, he is always so passionate on the floor when it comes to the issues that are not only pertinent to his state but to this country. And again, he's laid out, you know, to me, such a logical case on the debt of this nation and why we need to deal with it. But I will address that also. But I came down here just like the Senator from Colorado to talk about the FAA bill. And I wasn't planning to come down, honestly, Mr. President. I was in my office and you know as senators we have lots of meetings lots of events lots of activities and photo ops meet and greets they call them people come in say hello and chit chat with you and you get some photos with them they're residents from your state and i was sitting there and having a great conversation there was five young people uh, a couple four of them from girls and boys nation who are here from the american legion auxiliary uh, there is uh, clara from Kodiak and Joseph from Healy and Derek from Palmer and Marissa uh, from Anchorage and then there was another young woman who was there, young leadership student, uh, Jocelyn from Juneau and you know just to be a photo op is what they call them and we can shake hands and take some photos and it was interesting having the conversation because the first conversation they asked me was what's going to happen with the debt of this nation and before I elaborate on my thoughts and what I told them. I, I first, because they're both related, the FAA bill, what's going on with the debt, it's all related. It's all related because all this inability to resolve these issues are being created by the House majority. The inability for them to function. The inability for them to do their work. FAA is a great example. I know the Senator from Colorado mentioned that the uh, conference committee hasn't brought out a bill. What's amazing about this is the Senate appointed their conferees in April. And for those that are watching, the way this works, the House passes a bill, the Senate passes a bill. They're not always exactly the same, so they go to a joint conference committee made up of members from the House, members from the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, and they work out a compromise. Well, the House members, or the Senate members, have and did appoint their members in April. The House hasn't appointed anybody. Anybody. So the battle we're in is because of one person. One person who's decided that 4,000 people should be furloughed, about 80 in Alaska, to stop projects that are critical to safety, airport transportation. Now, I can tell you there is no other state, no other state that depends on air transportation like Alaska. Eighty percent of our communities have no access by road. It is by air. And so for one person to decide that he wants to play politics or he doesn't like something, oddly enough, the items he wanted to eliminate are from states that are represented by Democrats and chairmen of committees. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, I, I didn't come here two and a half, three years ago to play those games. I came here to do the work that the people of Alaska sent me to do. Part of that work was to make sure that the federal aviation administration actually has legislation that they can operate under because they haven't had it since 2007. I got elected in 2008. They've had 20 extensions to this while they work out the differences. The Senate did pass a bill. We did our work. We did it. We did it with a lot of debate. I sit on that committee, a Commerce Committee, as a member. Senator Rockefeller, Senator Hutchinson, Republican Democrat did the work with all the members. We then sent it over, House passed theirs, and now we're waiting. We're waiting for the House to do something. Not one person, because that's not how this system should work, but appoint a conferees 
so we can sit down and resolve these final minor issues. But instead, the chairman decides over there that he thinks best, he knows best. Here's what happens. Yes, 4,000 people get furloughed all across this country. People who have mortgage payments to make and probably some kids they have that are planning to go to college this fall and they have, maybe they're the only breadwinner in their home, uh, but 4,000 people, 79 in Alaska, direct FAA employees. But compound that with the next piece of the equation. Part of the FAA bill is to invest the people who fly, I fly a lot, I think I'll hit probably 100,000 plus miles this year, maybe more, 125,000 miles flying back and forth from Washington to my home state, visiting communities all across my state. And I pay a fee like everyone does in our bill that we pay for our tickets to go to the FAA who then invest them into making sure our runways are safer, our facilities are safer. It's the people who fly their money that goes to the FAA to pay for the improvements that we use when we fly. It's not complicated. And yet, what's happening, because the airlines don't have the authority to collect this tax, this fee, they're unable to then collect it and give it to the federal government. Now, it's important, that fee. And I'll get back to this fee in a second of what's happening with that money. But first, without that money, you cannot do the construction projects. It's all part of the system. So in Alaska, it's a pretty important piece. In Bethel, a project now has stop work order there because they can't complete the project. Now, as my friend from Colorado mentioned, uh, Colorado has a short construction season. We have a very short construction season in Bethel. And so we're trying to build a project there that improves the approach lights, make it safer for people to land at the Bethel Airport. That project has been stopped. There's no other access to Bethel except by air. We're 400 miles from Anchorage, the largest city in the state, by air, because you cannot drive to Bethel. So that project has stopped. Another project is the air traffic control tower in Anchorage. Now people say, oh, it's just a tower, what does it matter? Well, you know, the tower's old, it needs improvements. And here's why it's important. It's not only important for Alaska, and again, the people who would do that project, it's important for this country. We're the third busiest air cargo airport, in the sense of cargo throughput, in the world. We move products from around the world through Anchorage that are produced around the world and produced in this country. If you're shipping something to Europe or Asia and you're west of the Mississippi, the odds are you're coming through Anchorage International Airport. Almost 700 wide-body jets fly through there every single week carrying cargo. The third busiest cargo throughput in the world. It's an economic engine. It's a job creator. I remember almost 25 years ago, when the idea from two companies, a couple companies, FedEx, UPS, said, geez, we'll look at Anchorage as maybe our international hub because of its location. Today, it's a robust facility, and many other airlines and airport, airlines use it, and cargo air, air facilities use it. Huge. But again, because the House isn't doing their job by appointing conferees, Resolving this, instead one person decides he wants to play politics over the life safety of our air traffic system, the federal aviation system, that project's not happening. So not only are the 79 FAA employees furloughed in Alaska, projects in Bethel and Anchorage aren't moving forward, so that means the private contractors who concern, it's not government employees that make these improvements and build these uh, uh, extensions or lighting systems or remodeling the tower. It's private contractors who employ people who then pay mortgages and buy cars and spend money in the economy and help our economy move forward. 
So their action is clearly a job-killing action. That's what it is. Now, they'll say some other reasons, but that's what it's doing. It's killing jobs. And it's hurting and going to cost more. Because when the season's over in the next month or month and a half construction season in Bethel, you don't get to come back in November and say, we're going to finish this project. You can't. The weather conditions don't allow it. So what you'll end up doing is next year, and of course the costs will go up because the private contractor, and I hear a lot from folks on the other side over there in the house talk about private sector, private sector. Hey, I'm from the private sector. I don't know how many of those guys work in the private sector. I, I have. That's why I made my living. That's why my wife makes her living, from the private sector. And they spout off about how they want to support the private sector. Well, then pass the legislation that the private sector supports, wants to see move forward for the creation of more jobs and an opportunity to make our air safer. So again, Mr. President, it's astounding to me, you know, how dysfunctional the House majority is over there, how they're unable to do the work. You know, they complained a lot earlier this year that the Senate doesn't do their job and we're not doing our work. We are doing our work. We passed the Military Construction VA bill. We passed the FA bill. We passed several things out of here. It goes over there and dies. It goes over there and they have one person who decides they know best. Uh, a lot of those guys ran in 2010 on the effort to open government, 72 hours to review bills and all this other, which is great. I'm not seeing it. Not seeing it. They had some rules committee meeting uh, earlier last night or whenever late night they did it to set the rules of what they're going to vote on in less than you know, 12 or 13 hours. I'm sure that's been notified to a lot of people. It's amazing to me these guys ran on the fact they want to open government, the system's broken, and then it's so dysfunctional over there. The FAA bill, as I mentioned, these airlines collect fees that then go to the FAA to make sure all this happens. It's part of the fee we pay to travel. Well, now they're not authorized to collect it, but what happened? Several of these airlines jacked up their fees to collect the money for their own. $200 million a week coming from consumers into the pockets of these airlines for their profits. Not to improve the safety of the airports, which is the money it's supposed to be designed for. Now, I will say, Alaska Airlines, and I'm proud to say Alaska Airlines, Hawaiian Air, Spirit Airlines, are three examples of people, companies that did not do that. They did not jack up the consumer for their own bottom line. And remembering that their job is those fees are for the purpose of improving airports, not improving the corporate profits or the CEO's uh, million-plus dollar checks they get at the end of the year for their work they do. The problem is, we're, just like something that happened many years ago, something similar like this happened, we're not going to be able to get those resources back to make sure these airports are safer. I'd, of course, implore the airlines to do one of two things, to lower those fares they jacked up or put that money aside and work with Congress to make sure that money goes into the fund to ensure that we improve these airports. I challenge every one of those airlines that have done that because as a consumer who's watching this issue, they should be appalled that $200 million a week that you think or you thought was going to improve the airports you fly through, it's not. It's going in the pockets for profit for some of these companies. Again, I'd point out Alaska Airlines, Hawaiian Airlines, Spirit Airlines are a few of the only majors that aren't doing that. And I commend them for that. I commend them for doing the right thing by the consumer here. You know, Mr. President, I was originally coming down and going to talk, you know, as I got inspired by the students that were sitting there on the budget, I wanted to talk about FAA, but I want to get back to the budget. As I mentioned, these young people that came to my office and they asked the first question, <laughs> what are we going to do about the debt? Great, you know, it's the question. It's the question of the day. What are we going to do? You know, we can debate the how we got here, you know, Everyone got us here. 
Democrats, Republicans, current, past, everybody. We got a problem. We got a challenge. You know, I came here, I know presiding officers knew, you came here to solve problems, create solutions, not just play the politics and push it off for another day, but actually do some things here. That's what people sent me here to do. I know they send you here. The same reason, to do the job that the American people expect us to do. I know Alaskans expect me to do. It is no question in my mind why we are here today because, again, the House, House majority, I will point out, can't do their job. They're unable to do their job. They're not dealing with reality. Now, do I want to add more debt to the nation? No, no one does. No one does. As my colleague from Colorado earlier said, and I know the presiding officer, we've been working on ideas. And one thing that's unique about the Senate is there is an effort here. It may not be as visible as maybe the press like to portray because they'd rather see the battles that's better press. But I can tell you there's a lot of bipartisan discussion going on. The gang of six. Now you can argue if that's good or bad, but the point is three Republicans, three Democrats sat down for months. The Budget Committee, we sat down for months. We came up with proposals. We're talking to Republicans. Republicans are talking to Democrats. We're looking for solutions. We're trying to weave through this. The Senate is trying to do this, trying to solve this problem, create a solution that moves us forward. But there are several in the House majority over there that just believe drive off the cliff and, you know, that, that's good policy. I don't know. I, I don't think that's good policy. I'd rather drive on a road going somewhere. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do over the next few days here. You know, as I think of the differences, and, and people say, well, why don't you just take that deal or this deal? Here's the difference. They're fundamental. They're not, they're not complicated. The deal that the leader over there, the speaker, uh, Boehner has, is about $900 billion in reductions. It is short-term, has a joint committee to look to the long-term. What's the Reid proposal? Well, the Reid proposal is now scored by CBO, Congressional Budget Office, for those that are watching what all these things mean, uh, $2.2 trillion plus dollars in reductions. Two and a half times more, almost two and a half times more than the House version. And it's long term. Here's why that's important. I, I'm not voting for anything short term. Let me make that very clear, Mr. President and others who might be watching. You want to disrupt and continue to disrupt this economy? Keep doing these shenanigans. Keep doing these two, three, four month deals. That is disastrous to this economy. I have heard and have talked to business leader after business leader from associations to individuals to people back in my home state, and they say over and over again, don't do short term. Whatever you decide, give us certainty. Certainty. Give us a long term. Now, the unique thing about the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House, only would we describe long term as 16, 18 months because that's all we can do around here. But short term, as you can imagine, is two, three, four months. That will be more disruptive to this economy than anything we can imagine. Because all you do as we shift, and, and I can describe this in, in, because I understand this business, I've been in it, my wife's in it, the retail business, here's what happens. We'll have this same debate in November, probably. Well, here's what happens in November. This is the biggest time or the, 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 for, for people who are buying, for retailers, this is the most important time. November, actually back to school a little bit, but November through December. That's when people make their expenditures and buying things and consuming and spending money in our economy, creating private sector. Let me underline that because I know a lot of people think because they always like to blame Democrats as all about government. Hey, I come from the private sector. That's why, as I said earlier, that's where I make my living. That's where I made my living. It is an important part of our economy. So here we're going to debate, create more uncertainty in the most important time 
When consumers are going to try to judge what they do, what do they do? Do they spend a little bit extra on their gift for their friend? Do they go on that trip they're planning? Do they make that extra expenditure? And yet we're going to have the same debate. So long term is important. And again, how we measure it here, 16, 18 months. But that's better than the short term plan. Again, no business person has come to me. And I challenge any business person, pick up the phone, call me, let me know. Tell me you want a short term, and I'll be happy to come down here to the floor and say that. I will mention your company name. I will tell people this company's interest in short term. I'm happy to do that. I'm not going to get those calls because they know that's not the way to run a business. That's not a way to run a household. And that sure to heck shouldn't be the way we run our government. So there is a clear difference. For all those people that, and I get a lot of pro and con on this issue, calling my office, sending me emails. For those people that say, hey, just vote for the Boehner thing, I'm telling you why I'm not. I want you to understand clearly my position. It is not about he's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. That's irrelevant. It's short term. It's less spending reductions. It keeps us in turmoil. It doesn't move us forward. It's all about shenanigans and game playing in politics. That's what he's presenting. Now, maybe the reproposal isn't perfect. I know there's Republicans that have some ideas here on the Senate that want to modify. Great. But it's long term, has more significant reductions, and moves us down a path in the right direction. It's not perfect. But I can tell you the, the idea they have over there will not work for this economy. Mr. President, I've probably spoken too long here, but you know, those kids from Juneau and Healy and Anchorage and Kodiak, you know, they had a great question. When kids are asking that question and they say to me, and I give them the same exact presentation. I say, here's the differences. And I give them the papers that people have done and say, here, you, you look at it. And they say to me, why aren't we doing a long term? Because why? These kids are now at an age where they're thinking about their future. They're not thinking about the next weekend. They're thinking about their future. They have a position that we could learn a lot from around this place, I'll tell you. And they made it very clear to me. Whatever you do, make it long term. Because they're thinking about their future and where they want to be. You know, it's a, an incredible commentary when you have kids who have more wherewithal in the sense of their knowledge of what should be done than the body we sit in today. It should wake us up. The last thing I'll, I'll note, and you know, I, I think about what my colleague from Colorado said about the value of our position in this world when it comes to ensuring that people understand that America will stand behind everything we do, the debt we do, the positions we take. Matter of fact, it was so important it was written into the Constitution that we should never question the ability for us to pay our bills. For those on the other side that like to spout off and they pull out of their pocket the little portable constitution and all of us get those, we all have those, and they cite the constitution. Sometimes they forget sections of it. Uh, I hope they don't forget this, this section. We should never be questioned in regards to our debt. We pay our bills. We stand behind what we do. That's what makes our country different than any country in this world. So I challenge them to get their job done, maybe on the FA bill, maybe on this issue around the debt, but the House needs to get their act together, the majority, let me make that clear, the majority over there, get their job done, quit killing things over there from jobs to legislation, focus on the work that people sent them here, especially the group in 2010, but who sent me here and sent the presiding officer here? We were sent here to do a job. It is outrageous to me that we cannot move forward when it's so simple in the sense of a plan that gets us on path, long-term, has better spending reductions. It just, to me, 
Maybe it's too logic, logical. <laughs> you know, maybe that's the problem around here. You get too simple, too logical, it doesn't work. It has to be complicated and a lot of gamesmanship is the only way it works. You know, I, I want to prove that wrong. And again, Mr. President, I, I thank you for allowing me the time to say a few words and, and you know, to hopefully the people that are watching us and listening, that they hear the real debate and cut through all the, the moment in time of politicizing. And maybe, hopefully they hear those six kids that I heard and heard their concerns and what their position is. So again, Mr. President, I thank you for the time and I yield the floor. Mr. President? Senator from Minnesota. Uh, are we in morning business? We are in morning business. Great. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise today to pay tribute to former Minnesota Twins pitcher Burt Blylevin, who this week received his sport's highest honor when he was inducted into the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. To Burt, I offer hearty and well-deserved congratulations to the rest of the baseball world, I ask the question, what took so long? In the 14 years since he first became eligible for the Hall of Fame, we in Minnesota all assumed that with his rare talent and Hall of Fame numbers, Burt was a shoe in and for many of those 14 years, he was considered the best player never to have been inducted. I am proud to say as a Minnesotan and a lifelong Twins fan that this year Burt Blylevin was officially voted into the Hall of Fame. People in Minnesota all know that uh, Burt belongs in the distinguished list of Minnesota Twins already in the Hall of Fame, Harmon Killebrew, Rod Carew, and Kirby Puckett, as well as two other baseball greats who grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, later played for the Twins and were in, uh, inducted uh, into the Hall of Fame, Paul Molitor and Dave Winfield. Uh, each of them had F Hall of Fame careers and now Burt has finally joined them in, in the Hall. Burt pitched 22 seasons in the major leagues, 11 of them for the Twins, but he also took his talents to Texas, to Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and California. During his career, he won 287 games. He struck out an amazing 3,701 batters and is fifth, fifth on the all-time career strikeout list. It's more career strikeouts than uh, pitching greats Tom Seaver, Walter Johnson, Bob Gibson, Greg Maddox, Cy Young, or even his boyhood idol, Sandy Koufax. He pitched 60 shutouts and led the league in shutouts three times. He had a career earned run average of just 3.31. He pitched 242 complete games. That would just be unheard of today. He played on two world championship teams in, in Minnesota with the uh, 87 Twins and in Pittsburgh. And for Twins fans, we all know Bert as a major part of that 1987 Twins world championship team, uh, which we all revere for finally bringing a world championship to our, our state. And then we won it again in 91. Uh, Burt mentioned in his acceptance speech on Sunday that he is the first Hall of Famer b born in Holland. He moved to California as a child and became interested in baseball by watching Sandy Koufax pitch for the Dodgers. His father, Joe, also a baseball fan, built him a pitcher's mound in the backyard where he developed one of the best curveballs in baseball history. I like to think that if my dad had built me, no, I don't think I'd be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Burt finished his playing career in 1992. In 1996, he rejoined the Twins in the broadcast booth where for many years he and Dick Bramer have become familiar voices to Twins fans all over the upper Midwest. 
I personally love nothing more than watching a Twins game on TV and listening to Dick and Bert, who in my humble opinion are an authoritative and amazingly entertaining broadcast team. During broadcasts, uh, Bert has created a, a phenomenon using his Telestrator uh, where Twins fans, whether they're in uh, Target Field or, or uh, on the road, uh, hold up signs to catch Bert's interest and then he will circle them. There is, there is no higher honor for a Twins uh, fan than to be circled by Bert and every game is packed with fans holding signs that simply say, circle me, Bert. It was uh, great to see that Bert was joined at Sunday's induction ceremony by his wife Gail, their children, uh, Bert's siblings, and his mother Jenny. During his speech, Bert spoke about his father Joe, who died in 2004 of Parkinson's disease, saying, I know he's up there right now looking down. And in memory of his father, Bert, and his wife Gail started the Circle Me Bert website to raise research money for the National Parkinson Foundation, Minnesota. Uh, that really says volumes about Bert Blyleven. And Bert is just known in Minnesota for his dedication to other charities and to the community there. So once again, Bert. Uh, as a lifelong Twins fan, thank you and congratulations. After 14 years of waiting, you are hereby circled by the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame where generations of fans from Minnesota and around the country and around the world will know of your career and your amazing contributions to the game of baseball and uh, to uh, the community of uh, Minnesota. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you very much. I, I yield the floor and would suggest the absence of a quorum and maybe also put in a word for Tony Oliva and, and then also uh, suggest an absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Mr. President, I <coughs> ask uh, for a uh, uh, unanimous consent to speak for 15 minutes. Uh, the senator from New Jersey will observe the quorum call, call is in progress. I ask uh, unanimous consent that further calling of the roll be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. The, without objection, the senator may speak for 50, up to 15 minutes. Up to 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I think it's uh, obvious to the world around us that uh, the atmos he atmosphere here is hardly one of comfort or satisfaction. The public doesn't see uh, the uh, agony of uh, the debate that's taking place uh, as we watch how uh, dysfunctional the discussion about the national debt has been here. Uh, we're, we, we feel the threat to America's world financial leadership that's lurking around here, uh, and uh, it's not very satisfying to those people whose homes are close to foreclosure or the people who need to be assured that health care is going to be there for them or that their child who can learn can get an education without mortgaging their future or even don't eat, can't even get a mortgage on that. So <clears throat> we look around and uh, we uh, watch and we listen and we see that the Republicans in the House and the Republicans in the Senate are in search for political gain regardless of the cost to our society and our nation. And I don't make this statement casually, but after months of watching and listening to the targeted goal of politics over the pain that could follow a default, no other conclusion, conclusion may be drawn. We want to consider the evidence By way of example, Vice President Biden convened a bipartisan working group to find solutions to get the national debt problem over with, get it resolved, and let us go on to our normal and needed uh, debate and business. After that, the Republicans walked out, walked out. Next, President Obama offered Republicans what he called a grand deal that would reduce the deficit by $4 trillion. Republicans ran away. And now, our majority leader, Harry Reid, has proposed a plan that includes more than $2 trillion in spending cuts. One dollar in cuts for every dollar that the debt limit is increased, and not even insisting on a dollar of revenues, which has been offered, suggested several times, but there is no way of getting through the obstinacy on the other side. Republicans turn their back time after time. Democrats in this Senate and in the White House have offered the Republicans compromise after compromise, but they don't see their target. Their target is to do damage to the Obama administration uh, so that it hurts sufficiently to discount the progress that has been made under, for our society under President Obama. And time and time again, the Republicans have changed their demands to find reasons to say no. Mr. President, are we asking the Republicans to do something radical, something never been done before? That's certainly not the case. Over the past half century, the debt ceiling has been raised 75 times, 
almost two-thirds of those occasions under Republican presidents. In fact, the debt ceiling was increased 18 times under President Reagan and seven times under President George W. Bush. Our country has never defaulted. And so the question that must be raised, what's different about today? Why at a time when we already face a real jobs crisis in this country? Would Republicans manufacture another economic crisis? Why would they do that? Will destroying the economy help Republicans win seats next year when people across our country are already expressing their dissatisfaction with the deadlocks that they see being displayed? We heard the minority leader say his number one priority is stopping the president from winning another term. What a goal that is. He is our president, elected by the people of the country. He has a term of four years and will be up for re-election. And we hope and we pray that he continues to be the president of our country. What good does it do to target our, the system? Make, make known what it is they stand for. So far, we've seen that they stand for nothing that's helpful to the average American. So what we need, what we need is a chance to have an honest discussion. Insecurity reigns as people grow more and more anxious about their, in, their inability to afford the basics of lives, jobs, health care, education. Uh, they, they see things, prices raised, being raised around them as their purchasing power shrinks. Look at the price of gasoline, you see a perfect example of what's happening. Add one Republican presidential candidate was asked, and I quote, the question was, does it strike you that as the unemployment rate goes up, your chances of winning office also go up? You know what her answer was? She said, I hope so. Hope so. What an outrageous thing to say from the halls of government, the high halls of government. I hope so. I hope that unemployment goes up, says she. Says she, so she might have a chance to win office. How cruel that's, that statement is. Make no mistake, if the United States Treasury runs out of cash next week, the principal, principal burden will fall on middle class families. But the effects of our total economy will be devastating as well. We, not, we may not be able to send out Social Security checks to seniors, benefit checks to veterans, the people who, who serve the country. Now stop paying them or paychecks to the men and women who now wear our country's uniform in Afghanistan and Iraq. Sorry, we can't pay you? Is that what we're going to say? Interest rates could rise almost immediately, greatly increasing the cost of mortgages, car loans, student loans, credit cards, you name it. And if middle-class Americans think that their 401k plans suffered during the Wall Street crisis a few years ago, imagine. What will happen to the markets if the United States government can't pay its bills or redeem bonds that are ordinarily turned in for cash? A default will lead to increased job losses at a time when we're still emerging from a recession. And 14 million people are now out of work. And those are the relatively short-term impacts. Mr. President, default crisis will damage our reputation, our credit standing around the world. It will call into question American credibility, stability, financial leadership. It will make our bonds and our currency less attractive to investors. And we may never recover the exalted status of our financial instruments. But in response to this looming crisis, our friends, the Republicans, are digging their attention trenches deeper and offering us little but circuitous routes to avoid more serious plans to resolve the situation. 
Their latest trick is to propose a short-term debt, debt limit that uh, increase that will leave us in the exact same position six months from now so that they'll have another opportunity to make political mischief. Imagine, imagine all kinds of tricks, all kinds of devices to try and cut short something that can be de dealt with and left behind and let us continue trying to solve the serious problems that our country has. The Boner plan, Boehner plan, sorry, the Boehner plan poses the same grave risks to our economy as default. CNN reported that the Boehner plan would probably still lead to a downgrade of the United States credit reading, rating. And Christian Cooper, head of the U.S. dollar derivative, derivatives, trading at Jeffries and Company, said, and he's an authority, I quote, from the market's point of view, a two-stage plan is a non-starter. There is significant risk of a downgrade with a deal that ties further cuts to another vote only a few months down the road. And so, Mr. President, it's time for the Republicans to remember that all of our citizens are entitled to be heard, not just the wealthy ones, not just the billionaires, the billionaires, the tea partiers, and the powerful because they have uh, positions that get attention when they make phone calls here. Inherent in our responsibilities are our obligations to preserve our strength as a democratic society. Mr. President, it's time to get serious. No more sleight of hand. Honest discourse is essential. And the other day, we were reminded, and I, I described my own reaction, uh, shocked. They had a picture of lovely looking young people walking away from daddy's airplane that they had, whether it's a charter or owned, I don't know, uh, to go to camp. Mr. President, I did well in business. I ran a big company. I got there because I got the GI Bill to help me. GI Bill helped me start a company with two other people, two other fellows, that has 45,000 employees 45,000 jobs because I was able to get an education under the GI Bill. It was fantastic. And so when I see what's being prized as a front page picture in the New York Times of this child, looked like a lovely child, uh, walking to camp from daddy's airplane. And to me, I don't object to that. If they make their money the, le the legal, a uh, responsible way, they can spend it any way they want. But why the devil wouldn't they want to contribute something to the underpinnings of this country? I don't understand it. Why is there resistance from those who've made so much that they can have yachts and airplanes and this and that? It's said sometimes here as last resort, oh, it's class warfare. That's what we're witnessing. Class warfare. The warfare, it comes from the top down because the average citizen, those who work for a living, those whose jobs right now are often insecure, those who watch their 401k <clears throat> precious savings may be being dwindled as a result of a negative change in the marketplace, saying the young people in their family, sons and daughters, who have the capacity to learn, I wish that I could afford, said dad or mom, I wish that we could afford to send you to the right kind of a school that your ability suggests you can handle. But we can't afford it. If we do a disservice to that family, we do a disservice to our country when those things happen. So I don't understand why those have so much made, not by their own ingenuity exclusively, but made by the fact that we have a foundation in this society of people who want to go to work every day and do the right thing, and that's what holds up this, this facility of ours. I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about the facility that this country has. You can't build a house 
from the foundation down, from the, sorry, from the ceiling down, from the chimney down, and you can't build a society from the top down. You need the underpinnings. You need those people who bring their skills daily to work and hold out hope for their children to succeed. That's what we need. We need a re regeneration of spirit in this com country of ours. But it's not going not to happen when the Republicans' dominant view is, no, let's get Obama. That's what we have to do. Foul play. It's almost like desertion. I wore the company's, the country's uniform proudly. And that's what we're talking about. Loyalty to country. It says that we need everybody to participate. We're just not going to get it with the foul schemes that are being proposed. And so, Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum.